everybody, and welcome to the October 15th Trips and Traps. Andy Serling, joined by Richard Migliori. I like our little mixed bag of races today, and uh, a couple, I think, horses were giving jockeys a hard time, and one in particular, I think, a good rider needs to improve on one thing. I agree, and I think we'll talk about that in our first segment. We're going to talk about the number four defining product from the fifth race on October 8th, and we were talking about it beforehand. I don't think there has been any rider that overall, since at least the middle of Saratoga, that has been riding better than Jose Ortiz, and that might be in the entire country, and it certainly is around here. If he's got one Achilles heel, it's sometimes marrying himself too much to the inside in turf races. Yeah, and, and we've talked about this a lot in the past. Your best riders always give themselves a few options, as many options as they can possibly give themselves. And it seems like, and I agree with you, I think Jose Ortiz has been riding tremendous. The momentum he built up towards the end of Saratoga carried over into Belmont. He's winning races in bunches. You see his confidence level is just through the roof. But he got it in his head that he was going to stay on the fence and didn't even consider any other option and ultimately it cost him here. I wonder if he remembers when Cornelio rode this horse last year at Belmont and he came through on the inside to win a race. On the other hand, he did the same thing with a horse on Monday's card that was favored and he got in trouble in the stretch and he still was able to extract himself and win the race. But that's not often going to be the case. And the problem is in doing so, he did this while everybody else was gathering momentum to the outside and he had his chance here to float off in the two path knowing there's a good chance that horse on the outside is going to drift. Instead, he intentionally dove to the inside and it ends up just completely burying him. Yeah, and you can see when the, the uh, horse on the lead with uh, Rosario, Bayon Summer, drifted back over, there was a space between that horse and the weakening horse's outside. So now if you had just been waited a few more strides before you ultimately made the decision inside or outside, a, a spot would have presented itself, and then you would have had a clean, smooth kind of transition into the stretch. I know, you know, it's a jockey's lot in life. If you save ground and you get stuck, you're a goat. If right. he gets through there, he's a hero. The point we're making is you're going to be more successful if you give yourself more options. Right. It's just a question of giving yourself options, and I think he overcommitted to the yep. inside. Listen, the guy's been riding great. Sometimes things don't work out. It didn't for Define Product, who was unlucky here. He's riding great. It didn't work out. The other good thing is he's young and he'll continue to learn. No, I agree. And it's just, listen, if everybody had just one thing that they needed to do to make themselves better <laughs> and perfect at their jobs, we'd all be a lot better at our jobs. We'll turn our attention to the first race on October 9th. This was Friday. And these were two-year-olds, a lot of first-time stars going six furlongs. We thought the four Owsby was a horse that, I don't know if this horse is even going to be ready to win a race at second start, but it's going to get a lot from one start, and it's just a very green, immature horse. I extremely green. He broke slowly. It looked like he was running away from the outside horses, lugging in with Junior Alvarado. Junior's kind of riding him like, come on, but get in the bridle so I can feel a little more comfortable because to me, this horse looks like he um, was so green that Junior was never comfortable on him, Andy. I agree. And you know what I thought was amazing? Considering all of that, and he's four wide for pretty much all of the turn, and where he is in the race, he never completely and totally gave up. I mean, he only got beaten about six lengths in this race. And when you think about the way he, how, how mentally unprepared he was for the race, I don't think it was that bad an effort when you consider the trip and just how far away he is from being ready to win a race. Well, I think physically he showed that he's probably very capable of handling a group like this. Mentally, he was nowhere close to it. And just the fact that Bill Mott started him with blinkers, he's probably shown this in the mornings, the fact that he's a bit green. You saw in the turn, he was trying to keep after him to go forward. Then he was lugging in. He hit him left-handed. He ducked out. But even, you, you know how Junior Alvarado looks finishing on a horse. It looks to me like he's never quite comfortable, not you know completely comfortable that this horse might not do something really silly and he was a little bit tight on him and trying to keep him going forward but at the same time not being able to really ride him the way Junior Alvarado can finish on a horse. And I think when you put all that stuff together and watching the race and you talking about it he actually ran okay, and there's a reason that Bill Mott's first-time starters frequently need a race or two. He's just getting them into the game, and I imagine that they had probably told Junior, or maybe he'd even been on the horse, and he knew the horse wasn't really ready yet. Well, you know, it, it looked to me like this is a horse that he may have worked, and maybe has some of those tricks in the morning, and now you're riding him in, in a, with a group of horses, and you don't completely trust one. It's a tough spot for a rider to be in. Yeah, and all things considered, 
Oh, oh, Owsby ran okay, and I think he's one to keep an eye on as we go further along, whether in his next start or even the start after that. But he'll be a bit of a price because his PPs don't look that good. Race number nine, the same day, October 9th, we want to talk about a horse near Praying Mantis who did not get his position, Richie, going forward after basically breaking on top. And watch him in those green Roman silks throughout the running down the backstretch. He broke terrific. He had every opportunity to go forward. And... Listen, maybe he was under explicit instructions to take back. We don't know. That's the part we don't know. But what we do know is there was nothing smooth about the way he got his position going backwards. It's one thing if you're told to rate a horse and you ease back and you find a spot. Maybe he would have been someplace like where the one horse is now. But the fact that he's still going backwards here and it's not smooth. It's basically a fight. And then as soon as he gets back out to that position and there's an opportunity to put your hands down, now he starts going forward again. That's the thing. It's like he got him, and here it is right now. He's already starting to ride him, and he's taking him and getting him in between, and he's going back in. It's almost like, why did I bring him back that far? This was a race where the winner is sitting third in the outside, but second and third came from well back, so it was a fairly run race. But I just feel like this horse never got to a comfortable rhythm at any point in the race, Richie. No, it, w it was went from a pull to going forward, trying to find position. Then he's going to come out. And, and, and listen, for a horse to make this long of a run on the turf, he'd have to be extraordinary. Horses generally tend to have a quarter of a mile run. You're really, really good horses, three-eighths of a mile run. He was went from taking back to a full-out drive, about the three and a half for a long Yeah, and doing it while he's three, four wide on the turn, which is not the easiest time to do it. And I thought, all things considered, he only got beaten a little over three lengths. Now, three lengths in a turf race can be a lot more than it necessarily seems on paper. But having said that, you can watch the race. He still actually got interest in running down the stretch. Well, let me ask you a question. It, it, that three lengths we're talking about, and I understand what you're saying. You know, turf races, a lot of times, they finish very close together. If he was in the same position that the one horse was in, and he broke well enough to maybe get forward enough position there don't you think that was three lengths worth of getting back and kind of herky-jerky around to get out of the race there's certainly an argument to say that it was when you consider what he gave up to the one horse and my feeling is that the horse isn't exactly he's not exerting any less en energy than a horse who's holding his position in a comfortable rhythm than being jerked back and then have it going forward i think arguably he used up more energy you, you know and, and i made a comment before we came on about angel arroyo he tends to be aggressive that's why this ride surprised me and maybe it had something to do with right. Instructions. Again, we don't know that part of it, but he could have done a better job of being smoother about it. I think the first race was an example of Jose Ortiz getting married to an idea. It didn't work out. I will put that rider error. The second race we looked at, Owsby, a horse that was very green, makes the rider look bad. This race, again, I'll go back, this was a, a, a matter of a rider just not being as smooth as he needed to be. I agree. And it's eventually, it cost the horse his best chance to win. And at the end of the day, Praying Mantis didn't run that badly when you consider the trip in totality. And he's going to be back in at least one more of these maiden turf races. We'll have a bunch more, especially as we head to Aqueduct. We've got a few more weeks at Belmont. Praying Mantis is okay. Now, we want to talk about the seventh race on October 10th on Saturday. A number of people asked me about Eric Hansel's ride on the six horse, who was a speed, and he broke well. Richie and I feel as though it's defendable. The one, uh, the one in this race, Nusha's tail, watch him. He's coming off a layoff. He runs sneaky well. It's going to set him up for his next start. But the horse who really we want to talk about is the four in this race, payment terms, who takes himself back to last and ends up making this huge middle run, and he kind of ran off on Jose Lascano. Yeah, he took himself back there. Now you're going to see yeah. what we're talking about first with Eric Cancel. He's steadying there because the outside horse that was going to the lead, that was more Zen T, puts him in a tough position out of that shoot. You get the rail out, comes out to you a bit, and he's got Joe Bravo to his inside on Wild Night at the Opera, and he did the responsible thing. He protected Joe's position, which it, it, the onus is on him there to protect his position, but he had a steady because more Zen T took his ground coming out of that shoot, and that's why basically it wasn't his fault. He got shuffled back. Unless he went on a full-out send there, he couldn't avoid what happened. And you know what? He couldn't go on a full-out send, especially on that inner turf course. And I think Eric did a good job when you consider everything that happened. Now, meanwhile, <clears throat> the payment terms that we saw about a furlong ago, way back in dead last, has rushed up the front end. He's being followed towards the back by Nusha's tail. But payment terms, the one we want to talk about, Nusha's terms on the outside, on the inside, Foxhall Drive. 
what happened with payment terms who this is the second time he's gotten ranked when they try to stretch him out who at the end of the day is more effective sprinting but still he actually ran pretty well in here richie he ran fourth beating about three and a half lengths he ran extremely well but here's another case of a rider get made to look bad by the horse's actions. It looked like this horse was so lackadaisical the first eighth of a mile, Andy, that a natural inclination for the rider is like, hey, tap him on the shoulder. Come on, get in the race, get in the race. And then all at once, he locked on the bit and he ran off with him. And the more hold he took him, it looked like he was running out. And Jose then did what I think riders should do. He said, okay, I'm going to put my hands down and see if you'll settle somewhere in here. But I agree with you. This horse gets in a sprint they're going to go faster and you don't have to worry about all that nonsense no when he's been in sprints he's put in very good runs at the end of race to win his last two sprints have been effective the problem is he's only got three more weeks of turf sprinting here yeah. so i'm sure gary gullo wants to get him into a sprint race my question to you is if he's your horse and you get to aqueduct you're not in any turf sprints do you just put him away for the winter or do you give him one more chance going long and see if you can find a way to bury him inside of horses and somehow get him to settle See, I think that would be the, like maybe a, a recipe for disaster, especially at Aqueduct on a 7 8 turf course. You get a horse like him that looks like when he gets rank and you have to pull on him, he wants to run out. He's not going to make the first turn. Oh. Um, and, and especially if you get the opportunity to sprint him here before you go, now you've kind of gotten him keyed up again, and now you're going to stretch him back out. If you don't get to sprint him here, maybe you give it one try. But, boy, I, if I was a rider, I'd be worried about that turn. With okay, him. then I'll give you another scenario. Maybe you're supposed to find a way just to get him out of the gate and, and get him to go out of the gate and go to the front. Well, everything's off the break. You know, off of that break, he, it wasn't, just, he had no speed. He just had no speed at all. And then after he took him, maybe if he doesn't show any speed like that, you just have to sit quiet on him and say, okay, even if you get too far back, because I know if I ask you at all, you're going to run away with me. We might not see him again after Belmont until next year at Belmont. This is a turf sprinter because he seems to present problems going long. It seems to me like six or seven even would be okay because they're going to go a little quicker and you have no run into a bend you got a straightaway right. easier to deal with uh quick before we forget about him noosh's tail made a run up flattened out like a horse that just needed a run but i like that he made it up to the yeah. lead on the turn i like when horses do that and he reminds me of another pat kelly horse that did a similar thing that came back to ba aqueduct to win again last year perhaps we'll get it money with noosh's tail going forward he'll be a big price and fox all drive that's just the way it goes he was frankly dressed up off a turf very much favoring speed in saratoga and he just got unlucky i, I you can never blame a rider especially out of that inner turf shoot it's a very tricky little bend and if a horse gets the drop on you and with the angle it's easy for other riders to take advantage of that i agree and i think with eric Hansel, he's been so successful being aggressive yeah. that to jump on him over one ride it's not like he suddenly changed his tactics trips and traps at nyrink.com